Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Father's Day. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, before we begin, I just want to offer you a prayer, and then we will begin uh, our, our message today. Thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. I pray blessing upon every father uh, and every father's child that's listening today, whether they're young children or adult children. I pray for those who went through struggles as children, Lord, and they don't have maybe good memories. May they, some memories, maybe they somehow would look to you as their Heavenly Father and realize that you love them, you care about them, you will never abandon them, you'll be there for them. Lord, as we look into your word today, Lord, we're looking for something that will speak to us at these chaotic days that we're living. We pray that, Lord God, you will give me clarity of thought, that my speech will be clear, and that this, more than anything else, that this word will be clear and people would be able to apply it uh, to their lives. Uh, everyone that's listening and also myself, Lord, I need this just as much as anybody else. So have your way and Holy Spirit will give you the credit for every good thing that comes out of this today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This book, the book of James, is uh, believed to be written, of course, by James, the half-brother of Jesus. In John chapter 7, you'll find out that James uh, did not accept that Jesus was God's son, at least first of all. So that makes this book a little bit more intriguing and see how, how, how clear to the point he was in his teaching. Now, Jesus, James' main message is that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, your actions count, or at least they need to match up with what you call yourself. So this is number two in our series, and the, and the, 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 the big title uh, for, for this uh, series is called Guidebook for Jesus Followers. Now today we're calling this one, Not My Fault. I, I believe the message of James is so on target for today's world. It, it reads like it could have been written last week. There can be times, we all realize this, when things happen to us and, and, and we don't really want to talk about accountability because it's always someone else's fault. We blindly behave like puppets until someone calls us out on it, then, of course, we're offended. It's very difficult to keep up in today's society. So what does the guidebook say about this? And that's what we're calling James, is a guidebook for Jesus' followers. Let me read the verses 13 to 18 of the first chapter. That's what we're going to deal with today. And James says, and remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which uh, entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect come down, comes down from our God, our Father, who created all the lights in heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. So the first area I want to look at today is I know I am not to blame. And that's in verse 13. And what it's really saying, that's not really my fault regardless of what happened. It's not really my fault. And, and in verse 13, James says, and remember, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Now, I know from personal experience how natural it can be to blame someone else for wrong behavior. I remember very vividly being taught by my parents not to... Uh, to say curse words or swear words, not allow that to be part of my vocabulary. Well, there was, there was just one guy who went to the same church when I was a kid, and he was around the same age as me, but a, a bigger guy, bigger built, and he would tease me, and he would try to get me in a bit of a confrontation with him, and he was a bit of a bully, and he would win. <laughs> he knew how to push my buttons, and he enjoyed it. And I remember, still remember one time, I think it was in the church parking lot, he had me on the ground in the dirt and I couldn't move. And, it, and in frustration and anger, I just looked up at him and I swore at him. And you know what it did? It made me angrier and more frustrated. And this is what I said to him. I could be a good Christian if it wasn't for you. Of course, it was my spiritual and youthful ignorance talking, but I was really saying, I'm not to blame. It's your fault that I swore. 
Another area I remember, and I could be dating myself on this one, but I remember several years ago, there was a comedian on television whose name was Flip Wilson. I don't know if anybody remember them or not, but I believe he coined the phrase, the devil made me do it. The phrase caught on for a while and it became popular to use if a person wanted to shift the blame for their actions. Well, I didn't do it. The devil made me do it. You know, we can be all good at that. It was the devil's fault. It was my spouse's fault. It was the fault of my father or my grandfather. You know, he had a bad temper. Or then, of course, it's a familiar one. Nobody's perfect. I couldn't help it. See, true change never comes unless we take responsibility for our actions. It may never change another individual, but I can guarantee you, I've discovered that I have changed when I take responsibility. You know, you and I were created with a powerful gift by God called free choice. Unless, unless you do not mind being a puppet on a string, we need to stop blaming others and our circumstances and our reactions to our past when we do something wrong or we make unwise wise choices. I believe we all need to broaden our understanding of God. He cannot be tempted to do anything wrong, and he will never tempt us to do wrong. We will, listen to me, we, not we might, we will go through tests in our lives, but they are always to increase our faith and cause us to lean into God more than him, ever. If we don't learn that truth from James, we will live an a endless cycle of blaming God or someone else for our own wrong actions. I saw something else in this scripture, in this passage, and it was, there is a familiar pathway to all of this. Verses 14 to 16, here's what it says. Temptations comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Notice, it doesn't say it was someone else's fault or everyone's doing it or I was forced to. Verse 14 says it comes from our own desires that we allow to grow. We don't want to hear this, especially when we're going through a bad situation or we're in the thick of a situation. <laughs> I don't want to hear it, but it doesn't solve anything. It just seems easier to say sometimes, but if that didn't happen or they didn't do it that, that we wouldn't have reacted that way. The truth is, none of us are puppets unless we allow ourselves to be. I read a good quote this week. It, went, it said this, sin is like a snowball rolling downhill. The more we give into it, the worse it come, becomes. The best time to stop a snowball is before it's too big or moving too fast to control. The, the reason I say that these verses that I just read speak of a familiar pathway is because it's been this way since humans started living on this planet, since God created us. Matter of fact, if we go right back to chapter one of Genesis, uh, it says, in uh, talking about the Garden of Eden, where God had created a beautiful, I, I just can't imagine uh, what it was like. And if you that, you that love gardens and love the outdoors, it's beyond our imagination how beautiful was it. The, the, the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, were put in there and God said, There's, you can have everything in this garden to enjoy. It's for your pleasure. Enjoy it. Except there's one tree. I, I don't want you to touch that one in the middle of the garden. There's a difference between testing and tempting. He said, everything is yours except one tree. That was a test. God knows. This is what the enemy said when he came to them. <laughs> and notice how he used God. He said, God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it. He's talking about the tree. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked dis delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open. The, the test was if the first two humans would trust and believe God or not. That's, that was the big test. Are you going to trust God? Are you going to believe what God said? See, he had already given them everything they would need to live happy ever after. And instead of believing their creator, they believed Satan when he questioned God's goodness and generosity. They fell for the temptation. Adam blamed his wife. Eve blamed the serpent. Adam blamed God too. And then he blamed also Satan for tempting him. He didn't take any responsibility for his own choices. 
And Adam seemed he was a lot weaker. And sometimes we pick on Eve, but I mean, Adam had his eyes wide open. Eve, Eve was, was fooled. And Adam just looked into his wife's eyes and took the fruit and ate it, even though he knew he wasn't supposed to. But there's another illustration about the familiar pathway, and that's in John or Luke 4. And that's, some of you are familiar with that, the temptations of Jesus. Jesus was preparing to start, just go full-blown in his ministry as, as, uh, as God in flesh on the earth. And he, he, he went and fasted for 40 days in preparation. And, you know, during that time, the enemy wasn't scared to come tempt him. And he tempted him in three ways. And I'm not going to go through the, all the details, but let's just give, me the, give you the gist of it. He, he tempted Jesus to take care of his needs in his way. He tempted Jesus to test God to see if God was really telling the truth. And you can read those things and look for yourself. He, he tested uh, Jesus uh, uh, and I tried to get him to gain uh, or tempted him to gain immediate power through another way uh, than what God said. In every temptation that Satan throws at us, he questions what God said and questions God's motives. In other words, he's saying, God's not looking out for you. There must be more. He's holding, out. He's holding out on you. He's not giving you everything. Satan never tells us that if we listen to him, that it will not turn out good for us. In fact, he uses bait that eclipses truth and consequences. Something like if you're a fisherman, you know, uh, you know uh, just a naked hook is not going to do a whole lot. But if you put a, a worm or something to bait that and, and, and to, uh, to tempt that fish uh, so they can't really see the hook, just a delicious worm, uh, then you're allowed to catch a fish. And that's how the enemy uses He uses bait. Jesus said Satan was the father of lies. And we seem to forget it. He plants seeds. And our choice to, to allow them to grow. That's our choice if we allow the seeds to grow. I, I was out, if you see the picture on the screen, <laughs> my patio, I would need some work there as you can see. Uh, I noticed some tiny green shoots came coming from the bird seed, coming out of the cracks, that was in my patio. And it's going to destroy my patio if I don't deal with it. Right now, they're just nice little green shoots. But my patio, will, our patio will eventually be destroyed if I don't deal with it. You know, this stuff, the way that the enemy comes at us, is always a familiar, same old, same old. We seem to have the potential to be fooled by it. I seem to have the potential, potential to be fooled by it. We, we, not, you know, we might not be able to stop anyone or someone from planting or attempting to plant wrong seeds in our hearts, but we can stop them from growing. I need to get out on that patio and pull them up. By the way, I still haven't got them up, so I got to get out and do that. In the same way, we need to pluck out bitterness before it even gets growing. Hatred, rejection, racism from taking root. Deal with them immediately. See, self-evaluation is healthy and needs to be ongoing. In Colossians, I found a, a couple of verses, and I want to read them to you. It says, think about the things of earth, the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And it wasn't say, don't get involved in earth. It's just saying, the things in heaven is always done to God's will. So think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. So put to death the sinful, earthly lurk things lurking within you. In other words, pull them with seeds out of your patio. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. That's in Colossians 3, 2 to 5, as you see there. We always need, this is the message from those verses, we always need to realign our interests and passions with the Word of God. We also need to refuse the detours that the devil and the world offers us, and they will. I can guarantee you there's a familiar pathway. They will offer it. This seems to be an ongoing thing that we seem to appear out of nowhere. So we got to root them out because of this. We're given a straightforward warning in verse 16 in our text. Don't be misled. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. That word misled means it's, uh, cause someone to have a wrong idea or an impression about someone or something. In other words, don't get the wrong idea about God in your mind. Don't be misled, brothers and sisters. 
that the enemy comes a familiar pathway. Don't be misled. The third thing I see in this is God is a good God always. If we doubt that for one moment, and, and some today you could be, listen to me, and you're going through horrific things right now. Maybe there's something that's happened that's just taking you by surprise and you feel like you've been side struck and 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 it's so easy for to take offense because we don't understand what is happening and we will always blame someone or blame god if we don't continue to believe god is a good god always there's some got to be something i don't understand about this because god would not bring evil on me our text says whatever is good and perfect verse 17 comes down to us from god our father whatever is good and perfect who created all the lights in the heavens he never changes or casts a shifting shadow he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word you know the true word is jesus christ john 1 talks about and the word became flesh talking about jesus and we out of all creation listen to this and we out of all creation became his prized possessions these, these uh, verses are telling me that I need to remember the character of God and how he feels about humanity. And even more when I'm going through a hard time. God is always good. Underline it. Highlight it. God is always good. And if you're struggling with that sometimes, write it in big letters on a card, and something on a big sheet of paper, 8 by 12 to 11 piece of paper, and put it somewhere. God is always good. And next, God will never change. He will always be good. God doesn't get to, uh, you know, uh, um, some things like we, we could go through with memory loss and uh, uh, amnesia and, oh, well, I don't know what I'm doing today or dementia. God is always good, always. He provided a way out of humanity's mess. We say that in verse 18 where it said he chose to give birth to us. John 3.16, you know what? God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The Living Bible puts this verse that we read, it was a happy day for God when he gave us our new lives. Oh, hallelujah. I believe that that gives us an indication why, why the devil fights so hard to convince us not to believe that God is good. Why he would use every little weed. Remember what I showed you, those little green sprouts? Why he keeps planting, trying to plant them, and we gotta keep pulling them up. God loves us above anything else in his creation. We out of all creation became his prized possession. Doesn't mean the earth or the animals and the trick but we are his prized possession god is good and the enemy is always trying to convince us that he's not i know this is kind of short synopsis on that passage i i would really hope and pray that these words today would equip all of us to discern what satan is up to when temptation comes on our way when the wrong seeds try to take root Trust that God is always good, regardless of what circumstances seem to say. Trust God's word. Realize that weeding out the bad is an ongoing task, but we are never alone in that task. God promises assistance for continual victory if we ask, and, and that can come in a variety of ways. And if we realize that at times we do not take responsibility for what we've done, and my prayer for you and for myself, is that we will be alert to what is happening around us and not be sucked into the blame game, which always hinders our growth. If I start living my life blaming everybody else for the way that I've acted or what I'm doing or what circumstances have come my way, I'll never grow as a person. I'll never grow as a follower of Jesus Christ. May God help us to be wise enough to realize that we're not puppets on a string unless we allow ourselves to be. We can make the right choices, even though they may be difficult at times. Jesus has promised us continual victory as we continue to trust him for our victory. Maybe today as I close that verse 17, that final verse I'm going to read today, can be our text and our theme every time we're tempted to blame and question God's true motives. Maybe you can read it with me. Whatever is good comes down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heaven. And look this, he never changes or casts a, sh a shifting shadow. In other words, remember the first, he said he never changes? Well, just flip back to the first of it again. What is good and perfect comes down to us from God. He never changes that. 
There's never been a verse written that says, well, God has changed his mind on that one. He wants to redact that, take it out of there. No, no, no. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Let's put the onus on what we can do ourselves and trust God to help us to change. Father, I thank you today for your word. It's so relevant in the, in the society where what we live in, where we're always looking to the past to blame things for what's going on now, and sometimes not taking our own responsibility. Lord, we we do we don't say and 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 erase what happened in the past. We know some bad things have happened to many people. Even people listening today have come from uh, a, a very rotten family backgrounds where their dad wasn't what he should have been. But Lord, I'm so thankful that you showed us the Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father loves us and cares about us. And he wants to be there with us, to walk with us, and to help us in all of our struggles. For those today who cannot say, our Father who is in heaven, I pray today they will accept Jesus Christ as the personal Savior and realize that their lives can take a different turn starting right now, today. God bless, Lord. Would you just bless everyone today that's listening? Would you bless those that are hurting today? Would you bless those that have went through things, Lord, against them because of the color of their skin or whatever, their, 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 wherever they, their status in society and people have looked down on? May they realize that there's someone who cares about them and know they're on equal footing with everyone else because of what Jesus Christ has done. Change our hearts in our country, in our nation, around the world. And help us to see that the only way that we will see the peace that we really want is through Jesus Christ. Bless each one today. In Christ's name we ask. Amen and amen.